Hi. You don't need a laminar flow hood. Let's talk a little bit about sterility. Stay tuned for a special announcement at the end of this video. The dictionary defines sterile as being free from bacteria or other living microorganisms. When working with microorganisms like fungus, you need to make sure the environment it grows in is completely sterile. If other microorganisms are allowed to enter the environment that it grows in, they will compete for space and nutrients. In home labs, we usually achieve sterility through pressurized steam. And in industry, like for these petri dishes or syringes, they use gamma radiation. While it's easy to sterilize something that's in a bag or a jar, the problems arise when you need to open them in a non-sterile environment. Ideally, all you would need to do is run an air filter to create an entire room of sterile air. But can we ever achieve a completely sterile work environment? No. In theory, it would be possible, but in practice, even the cleanest of clean rooms are not completely sterile. While most of us can't afford to redo our HVAC system to create a positive pressure clean room, a laminar flow hood seems like a logical next choice for a lot of people, if you believe they are necessary to achieve a sterile workspace. But do you really need one? Laminar flow hoods or fan filter units can cost hundreds or thousands of dollars. Unless you are growing at a commercial scale for profit, which I do not encourage, it becomes hard to justify these expenses. You might think a flow hood is more sterile than a still air box, but if used correctly, both of them have a contamination rate close to 0%. They operate in two different manners to achieve sterility. The fan filter unit cleans the air and the still air box allows the particles to settle out of the air. If you are producing a substantial volume, a flow hood or a fan filter unit will make your workflow faster and more efficient, and the costs can be justified. If you are a home grower like me, who only has a couple monotubs growing at any one time, a still air box is more than sufficient. All right, guys. Let's head over to the workbench. Wipe down the surface twice with isopropyl. In the majority of laboratories, it's protocol to wipe a surface twice in order to properly sanitize it. Spray down the inside of your still air box and wipe all the sides. After you've finished this, spray down the inside and let it sit for 15 or 20 minutes. All right, before we jump in, I just want to talk about what kind of still air box should you get. In my opinion, I think it's better to get a taller still air box than it is to get a wider still air box. That's primarily if you're working with bags or pouring plates inside of it. You want a nice vertical that gives you a lot of workspace. You don't need a whole ton of horizontal workspace because you can take things in and out of it as you're working, but the vertical really helps. Another very important thing for working inside a still air box is having good lighting. I use this very bright LED light directly on top of it and that illuminates my workspace pretty well. I also have uh, this light directly above it, which also illuminates what I'm working on quite well. As for the holes, there's a couple different ways you can make them. You can take a large hole saw and run it slowly in reverse and cut these holes out. You could take a hot knife, cut your way around it. You could probably make your way through it with a cold knife. That would be pretty hard. It's not a big deal, but you do want to make sure it's big enough for your hands to go through. And if you're working with the bags or anything, it's normally pretty practical to have them fit through the uh, hand hole. Some of the tools that will help you out when you're working in your still air box is a pair of gloves. There's a lot of bacteria and other microorganisms that live on our skin, as well as dead skin cells falling off. 
which we need to keep off of our workspace. While this can be done using sterile technique and just not allowing your hands above anything sterile, the gloves are a good added measure of security and I would recommend it to most people. As I mentioned before, you have a lot of uh, dead skin cells and microorganisms living on your skin falling off, so it's often a good idea to use something like a long sleeve in order to cover up the skin that is exposed above your workspace. You often see me not doing that because I have developed my sterile technique to a point where I can feel pretty confident in working without that layer of protection. Another good item to have while working in a still air box is a mask. This will help prevent you creating unnecessary air currents and it will also stop you from spitting bacteria all over your workspace. Although it's not completely necessary because there is a plastic uh, barrier in front of your face. The last tool I want to talk about to achieve a, a sterile work environment is your sterilizer. Uh, a lot of people use a flame sterilizer. If you're going that route, please sterilize your tools outside of the stale air box because if you're spraying alcohol inside this closed area and then introducing an open flame to it, I've personally experienced it catching on fire and burning all the hairs off my arm as well as the stale air box jumping off the table. Now it's best to avoid this outcome, so I would recommend doing any flame sterilization outside of the stale air box. I have an induction sterilizer, which I built from parts that I bought on Amazon. If you'd like to build one for yourself, I have the parts linked into the description. If there is enough interest, I will make a video tutorial explaining how I built and installed this inside my stale air box. The way my induction sterilizer works it uses a high frequency alternating magnetic field to heat ferrous metals such as steel and it does this very efficiently. I'll demonstrate now. I have mine connected to a foot pedal so I'll, I'll put the blade inside of it and turn it on and that quickly it gets up to red hot temperature and this blade is completely sterile now. Alright guys I just want to talk to you about some general techniques when using a still air box now. Uh, imagine I'm working within this still air box. There are a few different things that I like to stay conscious of to make sure that my work stays sterile. So the first and arguably the most important thing to be aware of is don't be waving your hand all around in there. Don't be coughing inside of the holes you know if you're if you're smoking when you're doing this turn your head away at least you know uh, you don't want to be creating air currents inside of your still air box because that will defeat the purpose of the still air box I briefly touched earlier on how a still air box works every particle has mass and most particles are denser than air so if given a chance they will settle out of the air when we're working in the still air box, we want to make sure to regularly spray the inside. That way the walls and surfaces stay slightly damp with an isopropyl mixture. When any endospores or bacteria fall out of the air and hit one of the surfaces, they will stick to it due to surface tension. And the isopropyl inside of it will hopefully kill the contamination. So now we know the importance of minimizing the air currents within our workspace. What can we do to further increase our odds? I'm going to be using this jar lid as a substitute for a sterile work area. So imagine this is a sterile petri dish right here. Um, when you're working with it, you want to make sure you only grab it from the sides. When you're working with anything sterile, you want to make sure nothing goes above it except a sterilized tool. If anything other than a sterilized tool goes above it, contamination can fall directly into your work area. And that's where 90% of contamination comes from when working in a stale air box, in my opinion. I can't emphasize how important it is to keep anything that is not a sterile tool from above anything open and sterile. The last thing I try to stay conscious of when I'm working in a stale air box or in any sterile environment, is holding the tools by the base. 
I have this number seven scalpel handle. It's very long. It allows me to grip it far away from the actual blade, which puts space between my dirty hand and the sterile tool. A lot of scalpel blades come with a handle, a number three handle like this one. These work and there's many experienced mycologists who have used them and still use them to this day. I prefer the extended reach of the number seven handle. I'd like to go over some more specialized techniques when working with agar, starting with pouring the plates. When you pour the plates, it's good to allow the media to cool down inside of the still air box. This serves two purposes. This allows the media bottle to cool in a sanitary location, which helps prevent contamination from ingress of surrounding air due to vacuum formation. It's good to pour consistently and quickly. You don't want to be hovering over the dish for a long time or opening and closing it. As I mentioned earlier, a taller still air box makes pouring the agar hundreds of times easier. I'd like to discuss working with agar plates now. One of my favorite techniques, which you'll see me using a lot in my videos, is opening the plate upside down. So there's multiple benefits to opening the plates upside down. The first and most obvious one is that it's much easier to do with one hand. When you're holding a tool in the other hand, if you open this plate, it's much easier to do with one hand. For example, if I wanted to take a transfer off of this plate, I could open it like this, and notice how I, I have it at a slight angle facing towards the ground. I never really want to have it at this angle facing up because that would allow contamination to fall onto the dish. Facing slightly down, hold the tool at the base, and then take your transfer. On the dish that I'm transferring to, I like to keep it upright and right in front of where I have my working dish. That way I can open this one, have only the sterile tool cross over the plate or, or the lid of the plate that's open like this. And then when I close it, the other plate is right here for me to transfer it to. I transfer it to a plate that is right side up, not upside down. Remember when you're opening this lid up, it causes a lot of air currents. So if you're throwing it open and closed like that, you're probably gonna get contamination. So you, you just wanna be smooth and direct with your, with your movements. Grain. Working with grain bags can be extremely tricky inside of a still air box. That's why it's important to have a lot of vertical space to work with. For example, if you're working with a bag, you need a lot of vertical space so you can bring it up and then open it. And you see my still air box, it has just enough room for me to sneak up in here and drop things into the bag. If you prefer using jars for your grain, you have a few different options for the lid. Of course, you can use the tried and true lid that has an injection port and a filter on it. This is useful if you usually use liquid inoculant. What I normally use is an unmodified lid. I simply flip the internal disc so it's upside down. That way, the rubber won't form a seal and it won't explode in the pressure cooker. When pressure cooking anything that does not have a vent on the lid, make sure you loosen it by at least a quarter turn to stop the buildup of pressure. Likewise, once your grain is colonizing, if you don't have a filter on the lid, make sure you loosen it a quarter turn to allow the mycelium to gas exchange underneath the lid. You can also use a lid with just an injection port in a similar manner by flipping it upside down and injecting your liquid inoculant through the injection port. 
and then simply loosen the lid during colonization. Similar can be achieved with a plastic lid. Just loosen the lid during colonization and sterilization like you would with an unmodified or ventless metal lid. The last brief thing I want to talk about is liquid culture. When working with liquid culture, I recommend only using injection ports. There's no real need to open the lid of this jar ever. It's just an unnecessary risk, especially if you're making larger jars of liquid culture. You don't want to ruin the entire thing because you were lazy one time you used it. There's a few different ways I like to inoculate the jar through the injection port. The first is creating a slurry of mycelium on agar. This is quite simple. You simply take a syringe full of sterile water and you put a couple drops onto the agar plate. You scrape the mycelium off the surface of the agar and you suck it into the syringe. Once you have it sucked into the syringe, you just shoot those pieces of mycelium mixed with the sterile water inside of your liquid culture. Alternatively, you can also draw some liquid culture into the syringe and use that in place of the water. The second technique I use to create liquid cultures is a needle biopsy. This one can be trickier, but it's where you take a sample of the actual mushroom tissue using the needle and you have some sort of liquid behind it to propel it out of the needle. Similar to the example before on the Petri dish, but it takes higher skill and more patience. All right, guys, I hope this helps some people stay a little cleaner when they're working in their still air box. I know sterility seems like a daunting concept to new people, but it's really not that difficult to understand once you wrap your mind around it. So just to summarize what we went over, we want to wipe the surfaces twice and occasionally spray the work area when we're working. We need to keep anything other than a sterile tool from above our sterile work area. Minimize the air currents and hold the tools by the base. Injection ports are always going to be your safest option and a taller still air box is better for agar to grain inoculation within bags. All right, guys, I know I talked about a special announcement at the end of the video, and here it is. I've got a brand new Discord channel, links in description. And as always, links to all my other social media and any tools you might need are also in the description. Thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button and share this video to someone you think needs it.